Um, but it's a similar dilemma facing doctors who look after coma patients. Are these patients really conscious? In 2009, newspapers around the world carried this story about Rom Huben, who was a Belgian man who um, was involved in a traffic accident in about 1983, and he fell into a coma. And um, everyone had assumed that he was in a coma. And then, I think it was around 2006, um, he allegedly learned to communicate through a therapist who held on to his paralyzed arm and hand and said that she could feel him guiding her towards the keys on the keyboard. And Rom Huben began to speak. He began to talk from his coma about how awful it was to be paralyzed and to be locked in, but to be having these profound thoughts the whole time. At one point, he was said to be writing a book about his experiences. But in 2010, a more rigorous test was done. And the, the therapist was sent out of the room and the doctors showed Ron a series of pictures and said things to him. Then they brought the therapist back into the room and they asked him to describe what had happened during that time. And he couldn't do it. So that kind of, that sort of threw a spanner in the works for the idea that Ron was actually conscious. And then, um, and then his family got a bit fed up and <laughs> said, we don't want to do any more tests on him. So we still don't really know whether he's conscious or not, but the kind of current feeling is that probably not. But anaesthetic, anaesthetics are useful in this regard because actually by starting to unpick what they're doing to the brain when we fall unconscious, scientists are starting to make some inroads into understanding consciousness during coma or other altered states of consciousness. So all of this work is quite recent, but one of the early observations was that as you, as you begin to fall unconscious, it's a bit like if you imagine a house with all the lights on. Bit by bit, the lights seem to switch off. So one of the first things to go is the basal ganglia, which is what regulates movement. And then later there seems to be this disconnection of the thalamus, which is like the brain's central switchboard, so it takes signals and directs them to other parts of the brain and shares information. Um, but actually, so that was, that was, people started to think maybe there's this single seat of consciousness and when that button, when that light goes off, that's it. But actually more recent su studies, um, both in anaesthesia and in coma patients, are suggesting that consciousness isn't necessarily such an on-off thing, it's more gradual. So one of the, one of the most interesting uh, studies was published just a couple of weeks ago by some researchers at the University of Oxford. And they were using, again, they were using propofol, which is the standard drug that's used to knock people out in surgery. But rather than just, you know, getting a needle and squirting it in, and usually that make, makes you lose consciousness in, I don't know, five to 15 seconds, they were doing it much, much more gradually. So they were slowing the whole process of making someone anaesthetized over 45 minutes. And, um, and it produced some interesting results. So what it showed was that Actually, the, the um, progression into unconsciousness is, is on a slow sliding scale. So you start off feeling a bit lightheaded, which is kind of equivalent to being drunk. Then you get to a point where you won't, you won't remember stuff. And then you, you fall unconscious. And this is kind of, this is akin to sleep. So you start picking up these, um, these slow wave oscillations in the brain, which is where these brain cells are switching between a kind of active and inactive state. No one really knows what slow wave oscillations are there for and why we produce them, but the overall effect is that you, you fall deeper and deeper into unconsciousness. And as that happens, the ability of the brain to communicate globally, so different parts of the brain to speak to each other, becomes less and less. And as more and more brain cells fall into this slow oscillation pattern, um, eventually this plateau gets reached. And actually at that point, that seems to be the point at which there's no more long distance communication between the different areas of the brain. It doesn't mean the brain is unresponsive. So if you prick someone with a scalpel or you shine a light in their eyes, um, the areas of the brain that will respond to those signals, the kind of immediate sensory areas of the brain will light up 
and the thalamus will as well, which is the switchboard area. But it's not doing its normal job of routing that message to the other areas of the brain that would normally make sense of what's happening. So it's a bit like, um, it's a bit like a message is reaching a mailbox, but no one's actually picking it up. And all of this suggests that rather than there being a single seat of consciousness in the brain, it's possibly a more diffuse phenomenon. Consciousness is the result of lots of different brain areas talking to each other, not a single thing. And coma researchers are finding something similar in their patients. So in the past, people used to be quite seduced by the idea that if you talk to someone in a coma, um, you get you get lighting up in the area of the brain that responds to sound. And they thought, well, maybe this means that they can understand what, what we're saying. But it looks like there's this similar breakdown in global communication in the brain. So again, the message is hitting the mailbox, but no one's there to pick it up. But actually, these kind of studies, the study I've just talked about from Oxford, do have practical uses, because not all coma patients are equal. And it's thought that up to about 40% of patients who are in a vegetative state, you know, a coma, um, actually may be in a kind of slightly higher state of consciousness where maybe they, they can respond sometimes, but it's just not being picked up. So a few years ago, a researcher called Adrian Owens, who used to be, I think he used to be at Cambridge, but he's been poached by the Canadians now. Um, he took a 26-year-old woman who'd been in a vegetative state for five months, after, again, after a traffic accident, and he asked her to imagine two things while scanning her brain. First of all, he asked her to imagine playing a game of tennis. And then he asked her to imagine walking through the rooms of a house. Now, if you did this in a healthy person, you'd expect to see um, activity both in those areas of the brain that just respond to sound and talking, but also in the case of tennis, you'd expect to see some activity in the motor areas, the areas that are involved in controlling movement. And in the case of imagining someone to walk through a room in a house, you expect to see some activity in the area involved in recalling, recalling um, visual scenes. If you do this in an anaesthetised patient, you wouldn't expect to see this kind of spreading of activity. And when he did it with this, this coma patient, her brain looked just like a normal person's suggesting that maybe she was actually perceiving and thinking about these things, even though she looked like she was, you know, she looked like there was nothing there. He went on and did this in more patients, and certainly not all of them could do this, and it seemed to be a minority <coughs> of coma patients who were... Thank you. <laughs> it seemed to be a minority of coma patients, but some of them could do it. And even more remarkably... He's now using this away, as a way of actually communicating with people who are in this kind of locked-in state. So if you imagine, well, it means you can ask basic yes or no questions. So if you, you know, yes is, if you think yes to this answer, I want you to think of playing tennis. And if the answer's no, think of walking around a house. And so there's a way of actually communicating with these people who, until recently, we thought were, were gone. And I suppose what all of this is telling us is that consciousness really is less like a light switch and more akin to a dimmer switch. And these studies using anaesthesia could also be useful in terms of reducing cases of interoperative awareness or giving people too much anaesthetic because it's actually providing a tailored means of telling when someone really is under and when they're not. Now, research, I think researching and writing all of this has just given me a new respect for the humble hospital gas man because it really is taking people as close to the brink of nothingness as it's possible to go without dying. And every year, anaesthetists guide millions upon millions of people to this place, and then still without really understanding how they do it and not really being able to monitor them particularly well, they bring them safely back again. <laughs>